Uh, good morning, everyone. Welcome to the uh, Drone Tech's Introduction to Skills USA Drone Competition, uh, sponsored by NCAT and, of course, Skills USA. Uh, my name is Tom Biller, and I am the director of Drone Tech here at Northland Community and Tech College in Thief River Falls, also associated with uh, the NCAT. Uh, doesn't we had uh, about seventy something people registered for this, but I'm only seeing about six online so far, and so I'm imagining a bunch registered just to get to the links. But we will share all this material regardless on our uh, NCAT website also. So since there's so few of us, uh, maybe we can do a quick intro uh, with the people that are here, just kind of get a rough idea of where you're at and. Uh, what your background is and what you're looking to do. So, Brad, if you're on or listening, uh, would you give a quick intro? Yeah, sure. Uh, I'm a elementary school tech specialist and just recently got into drones. Uh, we're working with the Tello drones right now. And so I'm interested in anything that starts with the capital letter D. That's all I yes. got. Um, it's cool you're with the Tellos. We're going to be talking about Tellos a lot. So. Great. Yeah. Uh, where are you at? In uh, Central North Carolina. Okay. Okay. Good to have people from different parts of the country. Well, thanks for being here. Sure. Thank you. Uh, Darlene, how about you? Are you on? Uh, yes, I'm uh, for, from the Minnesota Department of Transportation Aeronautics. And just seeing what uh, everybody's doing out in the uh, drone world. Oh, awesome. Okay. Well, it looks like people, oh, I accidentally hit my point. Try hitting your left arrow on your keyboard, Tom. I am. <laughs> Okay, well, it looks like uh, we're a lot of people are tuning in here now, so we'll probably just go ahead and get started since uh, there's it's getting to we'll waste a lot of time uh, going through everybody. But I appreciate the those that uh, introduce themselves. And thank you. Looks like we probably have people from different parts of the country, as we just saw. Uh, what we're going to do today is go over the Skills USA and what they who they are and what they offer. And our guest speaker is Jessa Doms, the Minnesota Executive Director for Skills USA. Uh, she is feeling a bit under the weather today, so she's not actually going to present live. What I have is a uh, pre recorded uh, video of her outlining everything. She is, however, going to be monitoring the chat. So, any questions or anything like that, you can feel free to, to, to put them in the chat room or directly chat to her and she can answer them as we move through the uh, webinar here. So with that, I will think I will go ahead and get started with her presentation. Okay, so hopefully everybody can see that. Is everybody seeing the Skills USA uh, slide? Yep. Okay, here we go. Hi, my name is Jessa Dames. I am the state director for Skills USA here in Minnesota. So, what is Skills USA? Well, we're a career technical student organization, or CTSO, um, a national nonprofit with uh, branches in every single state, essentially. We serve middle school, high school, and college students in 11 different career clusters. You may be really familiar with um, CTSOs like FFA or DECA or HOSA or anything like that. So we all kind of fall under the same umbrella. We're serving students who are preparing for careers in trades and technical service areas um, and are in high quality career and tech ed programming. The goals of Skills USA are to prepare career ready students who will excel in work, um, who will succeed in life and become assets to their communities, our goal is to help young people understand their value and purpose and connect youth to in-demand careers. And how we do this is through something called the Skills USA Framework, our program of work, and a variety of assessments. 
So our SkillsUSA framework, you'll see, uh, looks a little bit like a, a triangle with personal skills, workplace skills, and technical skills grounded in academics making up all the sides. So we believe that career-ready students possess all three of these skill areas. And the framework is made up of 17 what we call essential elements, skills, essentially, that industry has identified as the ones that they say are most needed for career success. And I'm not talking about um, just getting a job, but being able to retain those employees and retain that employment. Um, our SkillsUSA framework is meant to be integrated right into a CTE classroom, into the chapter, into the workplace. And we also offer turnkey project-based curriculum, which can lead to both micro and full industry-recognized credentials through career essentials as well. We also base a lot of our, our learning and work around something called the program of work. And this is where our chapters provide rich, meaningful experiences via intentional instruction and activities that are gonna bring relevance to a student's future. So our students, some reason it quit playing Tom try hit the play button yeah for some reason we're having it it's froze on us here try refreshing the page quick okay and then we'll just have to fast forward to 227 Students are doing work in oh, the advocacy go. and marketing realm. They are oh, doing work with community engagement. Uh, you'll see pictured here a couple of community service projects that some of our chapters did this year, even in a virtual year, they figured out how to make that work. Um, uh, financial management, so fundraising for their chapter, um, handling a budget, both personally and for their for their chapter. Uh, leadership development. So we offer a wide range of leadership activities, conferences. Uh, we have local officer programs, state officer programs. Right now, um, we have a, a Minnesota native who is serving as the national, uh, a national officer for um, Skills USA, which is very exciting. We have opportunities for students who engage in partner and alumni work so that they are face-to-face -face with industry, um, working with the alumni who've come before them. Maybe there are current board members, maybe they're folks who are serving as judges for our competitions, things like that. And then we offer a variety of workplace experiences as well. How do we measure success in SkillsUSA? Well, for one, we are looking for quality CTE programs across our state and across the nation. And here in Minnesota, MDE's definition of a high quality CTE program includes student leadership development, leadership development through embedded classroom activities and career and technical student organization, opportunities, CTSOs. So it's right there for you. If you want to run a high quality CTE program, one of MDE's requirements is that you are giving your students access um, and opportunity to participate in a CTSO. And I think that SkillsUSA is a great one for you to take part in. We also have something called the Chapter Excellence Program or CEP. And this is where our chapters show their work related to the framework and the program of work throughout the year. Uh, and that can lead to recognition at both the state and national level. And then we have our Career Essentials Curriculum. That's what leads to that uh, micro or full credential. Uh, and that curriculum is offered at you know, the middle school level, um, early high school level, um, advanced high school level, and then also there are college options as well for those adult learners, especially in our technical college and community college systems. And then there's probably the most fun part for students, which is the Skills USA State and National Championships. Uh, and these are where our, we offer our career competitions, which are developed, facilitated, and judged fully by industry. Um, students come together and they engage in true to life competition that allows them to exhibit their skill and training and earn recognition for that skill via medals and sometimes prizes uh, and through our award ceremony. And then state winners get the opportunity to compete at the national level as well and show off their skills. And there's also something called international and there's world skills. So there's international competition 
which is basically like the Olympics for technically skilled um, individuals. And and I've seen videos. I've never been there, but I've seen videos. They hold it every two years, and it it quite literally the opening ceremonies looks like the Olympics. I mean, it's it's kind of amazing. So in light of the fact that we offer these career competitions, we are really, really excited to start offering our new drone competition here in Minnesota. This is brand new at the national level. They are just piloting this, no pun intended. They're just piloting this uh, right now this year in a virtual format to see how it works. And I really, really want Minnesota to be at the forefront of this competition. I think that um, we have some amazing things happening here in the state. We've got some schools that are getting really excited. Obviously, uh, we've got NCAT right in our backyard. Um, and so I want us to, to develop a really well-rounded program and get our students in um, at the ground level and um, have them engage in these competitions at the local and state level and go on and win at nationals. I really want them to just kind of, you know, be the, absolutely the best they can be right from the start. So we're partnering with NCAT to try to create opportunities in some of you know, the nation's fastest growing fields, aviation, engineering, surveying, transportation, entertainment. Um, and our students are going to be engaging in real world scenario based situations. So a little bit ago, um, when I spoke about our championships, I mentioned that these are true to life. And that's how a student described them. They are true to life. They are the kinds of um, situations and scenarios that a student would find themselves in if they were employed in the field. Um, and that's what we want our drone competition to look like. So students are going to hone their engineering design skills, their technical literacy skills, problem solving, systems thinking uh, in preparation for these events. And then the actual competition is going to evaluate students in things like flight skills, maintenance, um, troubleshooting and repair, FAA knowledge, and autonomous flight. So the contest itself will allow for teams of two. Um, we're hoping to offer it at the middle school, high school, and potentially college level. So essentially it would have three divisions. Um, we're gonna have contest committees that will provide the arena, the field elements, the judges, the awards. That's the Skills USA Minnesota side. Um, and the team itself is gonna supply the drone. It'll fit certain parameters. We're trying to be as cost effective as possible. Um, and then they'll be able to participate in local and regional competitions throughout the year leading up to state in August, in April, sorry. So I mentioned that um, Skills USA Minnesota is going to provide the contest, the competition, um, and CAT is going to be providing the programming and curriculum. So they're going to they're going to be speaking about that in just a moment. Um, but what's going to be focused on in our contests will be um, some of the following areas. So some of the skill and knowledge performance areas that will be targeted include um, flight skills. So students will need to prove their competency in the ability to operate a drone in a safe and effective manner as a flight team and then document appropriately. So teams will be given three scenarios and asked to plan fly, collect data, communicate, and document based on industry-generated scenarios. Now, I will say this. This information is coming directly from what the contest looks like this year. There may be tweaks, there may be additions, there may be changes that are made um, as we move forward with our planning, but this is really the basic idea that we're working with right now. Task two, maintenance, troubleshooting, and repair. So teams will be given virtual scenarios and asked to solve industry-based problems, improve competency, and the ability to troubleshoot and recommend corrective repairs, common to drones. Uh, students will need to uh, will need to understand the mechanics of how drones operate, including functionality of key components like sensors, controls, and other technologies. There'll be an FAA knowledge test. Um, and then task four would be autonomous flight. So students would be provided a mission scenario um, and need to plan and explain all aspects of the flight, as well as provide documentation, showing calculations and decision-making strategies. And they might be in evaluated in areas like um, effectiveness of mission accomplishment, flight plan efficiency, utilization of available power, cargo weight compensation, data sharing capability, communication, etc. So if you're interested in getting involved in Skills USA and you're interested in uh, being part of our drone program right from the get-go, 
it's very easy to get a chapter started. So I would recommend looking at starting a chapter um, right away in the fall so that you can get students excited. You can get them recruited essentially into your chapter. All you need would be a school staff member or instructor who's going to serve as the advisor. Probably yourself. It might be somebody else. Some schools have more than one advisor, um, but there are plenty of high schools, especially middle schools, who just have one advisor serving all of their interested students. And that's what you need next would be interested students. So you'd recruit those in the fall, get them excited about participating. Uh, because we are a, a student organization, there are annual dues. So advisors dues are $26. Those are our professional dues per year. Um, and every student ha have annual dues of $14 per student. And then you really can participate as a school in as much or as little as you wish. Um, you know, most of our high schools are participating in quite a bit of our programming. But at the technical college level, especially, uh, these are folks who are mainly um, getting involved right towards the end, right in the spring in, in just our competitions. That's more what their students are excited about and interested in. But our high schools are participating all year long in all of our program of work categories. The time commitment for an advise, advisor really varies. Um, this is a student-led organization. It is meant to be student-driven. And so ideally, you're, you as an advisor are providing a space for students, but they're doing the work. Um, there's a reason why every chapter and when I say chapter, that's really synonymous with club, but this is meant to be intracurricular, um, even though some, some chapters use it almost in an extracurricular fashion when they hold their chapter meetings and things like that. So, so let me back up. So it's really meant to be student driven. Um, again, you're providing a space, but, but your chapter is going to elect officers. You're going to have a president, a vice president, a treasurer, a secretary, et cetera. And they're really the individuals who are, go who are going to drive the decision making. Um, they're going to run the meetings. They're going to figure out what happens next. And all of your chapter members will be, will be kind of working right alongside them. And then when I talk about chapter meetings, you as a group will have to decide how often your chapter meets. So we, I've got schools where they meet once a month. I've got schools where they meet once a week. I've got schools where, you know, they um, they can only meet in 20 minute segments. So they actually have two meetings a week and run their chapter that way. I mean, it really just depends on um, how you want to run things in, in your school, in your chapter. It, there is no one right way. Um, and then there's opportunities for leadership conferences. So uh, again, a lot of middle school and high schools are going to participate in our fall leadership conference, really get students geared up for the year, get them excited, helps them understand what SkillsUSA is, helps them understand the framework and the program of work and everything else. So there is the potential for a three-day conference um, in the fall that's held late every October, just before Halloween usually. This coming year, it'll be October 27th through the 29th, and we'll be in Alexandria at the Holiday Inn. Um, and that's an opportunity for both leadership development, understanding Skills USA, and also career exploration through a variety of activities. And then there's our big event, um, kind of our culminating event every spring, which is called the State Leadership and Skills Conference. And that's where we hold our state championships with all of our career competitions. So that is four days in the spring. This year, it's going to be April 7th through the 10th, um, and our main hub um, is going to be the Hyatt down in downtown Minneapolis, um, but we do have contest sites really in a variety of educational and indus industry partner locations um, across the cities. And then there's other events that are held regionally during the year. And again, it's really up to you and your students how much you want to participate in. And a lot of my... Um, Newer chapters start small and kind of build from there. So my contact information is up. Again, Jessa Dames. Uh, my formal title is executive director. Um, email, phone number, websites for you to check out more information. Um, I can share this PowerPoint, this uh, presentation out after the fact. But I also wanted to include a few pictures of our um, most recent event, just to give you an idea what we're talking about when we're looking at our competitions. So again, keep in mind, this was a little bit different than a typical year. But what you're going to see here, um, if you start at the top of the screen and move your way around, um, you're going to see our students engaging in our cabinet making contest. The bright light is actually one of our photography contestants photographs, um, fitting certain parameters. You're going to see our electrical construction wiring contest. That was one where we actually got to do an in-person contest this year. Um, with very small numbers. Um, you're going to see a welding 
individual welding contestant, an architectural drafting, um, final rendering. You're going to see uh, a young man in our collision repair contest as well. So do, this is just to give you an idea of kind of students in action and what some of our, again, true to life, you know, real world scenario contests sometimes look like. You are welcome to contact me with any questions, and I look forward to talking with you more about Skills USA and how to get involved. And I'd love to see you at our drone competition. All right. So that was a pretty good overview of Skills USA. And like we said, Jessa is still on the chat, and she will continue to answer any questions anybody may have uh, as we move on. So let's get back to. Okay, so that was a great overview. Uh, she did mention, basically that's what we're gonna do is go through the drone competition specifically. She already mentioned uh, the key four key tasks areas. We'll kind of dive into the manual. Uh, one thing I want to mention is you probably already met your friendly neighborhood moderator, Steve Sorensen. He is, he's probably already done it or he's gonna be posting all the web links you'll see on the slideshow today. So they, so you can, uh, feel free to go to them on your own as we're going through it. Uh, so let's go into our first. Okay, so here you see on the right, the, the uh, actual competition manual, and those are the links which he has provided in the uh, chat. So I'm gonna go ahead and go to the first one. This site here, this is the industry partner that is uh, pretty much hosting the whole learning management system for the, uh, this competition of the uh, drone competition. Great company, They're, uh, they've done a lot of work to set this up, especially in the time of COVID to make this pretty much a virtual type event as best as they can. And like Jessa was mentioning, there will be some tweaks going forward, obviously. Uh, we're expecting probably them to open this up a little bit more next year's competition and the year after, especially. Uh, but I want to bring it to this page because this is the best place to go to get all your resources in one place. You'll see when we'll play a couple of these videos to give you an idea, but uh, the good overview here. The LMS instructions safety. They have each task. I highly, we'll, we'll actually go through the task videos. They're very short. They're about two to three minutes a piece. Just, they really do a better job of explaining the overall, what they're getting at when, cause that when you're going through the manual, it can be kind of, it's kind of hard to see exactly what they're after, but the, these little videos explain it pretty well. And then if you go down here, you see the different partners that are involved. You got cross flight, the industry partner, Pitsco, which is your, uh, supplier so they will actually sell drones and the game pieces and we'll talk about that as we go through the manual mind's eye which actually builds one of the drone kits that you can actually purchase to teach uh, the kids how to put a drone together all the parts and what they all are so probably the first thing we'll do is actually go into my manual and then we'll come back to the videos because they'll help explain it a little bit more Okay, so hopefully everybody can see the manual there. And you'll notice as soon as you go right inside the manual, there's a direct link right to that website we were just at. So that's probably the best thing you can do is go there first with the manual in hand and uh, watch the videos, but we will watch them here shortly. Okay, so like uh, Jessa was saying, brand new competition. It's unfortunately the first year's somewhat over, for all practical purposes. It came out late. I, I wanna say we got involved in January. In Minnesota, we made the decision not to try to run any kind of competition or tournaments this year. We figured we would spend the time trying to recruit and get teams together for uh, 2022. Uh, basically, like she was saying on her slides, the great thing about this is your team only needs to be two people, okay? So you could, Depending on how many kids are interested, you could have multiple teams or at a minimum have one team of two people. And as she was alluding to, the, uh, the only actual mandate for is the state competition. And the good thing about that is the state, whichever state you happen to be in, 
supplies all, all of the arena, the field elements and all of that. Okay, as far as the team, basically being registered with Skills USA, having your drone, and they say fully assembled, tested and operational drone with onboard camera. As we go through the manual, you'll see they're basically pointing you towards the Tello drone, which uh, some of you probably have or have seen at least the little, uh, and they have an onboard camera already and they're small, they're meant for indoor flight. So this is a pretty much the drone they're looking at for the competition. But as we go through, you'll see it's not the one you necessarily have to have. Uh, obviously, anytime you're around drones, eye protection, so you're always gonna have to supply eye protection um, and the official some type of polo or uniform to represent skills USA uh, she kind of mentioned the the task areas that they are looking at uh, as we go down here she already kind of went through these roughly uh, flight skills this is kind of broken up and this is the only actual flying that will happen in the competition is task one. And this is where the tello kind of comes in. And as you're watching the video, you'll get a good idea of what they're actually doing here. So they're evaluated in three different flight scenarios, basically on their piloting skills. Uh, in the maintenance and troubleshooting, this one's a little trickier because basically what they've done is taken this mind's eye drone and built a, a uh, computer-based uh, model out of it. And it's a multiple choice test. So basically from what I, when we watch the video, you'll see you can manipulate the drone and the students need to be able to recognize, you know, oh, this wire's hooked up backwards or this is wrong or that's wrong. There'll be general troubleshooting type questions. Uh, the FAA knowledge test, this is basically part 107. Uh, so free resources out there, FAA, you can, you can find the part 107 study guides out there and both, Members take the test and that they're graded accordingly. Task four is somewhat confusing because it makes it seem ideally you would actually be taking like a larger drone, like a Phantom or something. You would be uh, making a mission plan, executing it, going through the full cycle of pre flight, launching, recovery, post flight, and processing. And they give you some examples of some of the software, drone deploy, PIX4D, some of the more common ones. But the way they're going to do it, at least this year, is it's all a test. It's a multiple choice test online again, where they will give you certain products and the, there, there'll be calculations that the team has to do like they were actually flying. So they will kind of be graded without flying on the whole mission process. Um, let's see. As far as down here, it's basically mentioning teams are required to use their own computer unless it's provided. I can't speak for everybody. I know in Minnesota, we would probably supply all the computers and everything that would be needed at the state level competition. Um, oh, I, want, I do wanna highlight something here. A lot of schools on other types of contests feel like, I'll, I'll use VEX Robotics as a good example. You typically the school will go out and buy the competition field and have it at their school and practice on the actual competition field, then by the time they end up going to the state championship or the national, they typically tweak a few things so it's not quite the same as they practice. One thing I like about what they're doing here is they're pretty much building this to where they don't really want the kids to have the actual competition field. So, it, and you'll find as we go through the, the equipment catalog, some of this gets pretty expensive, but we'll, sh we'll show you kind of how you can get around that a little bit. Because our, our whole goal is to make this as cheap as possible for any team or school that would want to get into this. Uh, but that's what I like about them. They're, they definitely don't want you to have access to the LMS until the day of the competition. So it's the whole idea is that the kids actually know what they're doing and have the piloting skills, whether they have the practice pieces or not. And as she was mentioning, the good thing about Skills USA is they actually uh, they give you the rubrics and everything. They break down the tasks, and you can see here, depending on which area, whether it's knowledge, uh, you know, what all their look, skill or attitude. 
Uh, you can see, obviously, this is part 107 area tasks, and this is part of the mission planning, the post processing, and you, you can see which skill levels you need and where. So this does a pretty good job of laying down the specific actual tasks and these are these align to the standards of what a drone pilot actually needs to be able to do and of course the hardware part exactly what they're looking at basically things that are going to go wrong you need to know or be able to recognize hey my uh it's veering off gps coordinate flight path you know well, why is that what happened what do i need to do so that, that's kind of the whole idea there. And like I was saying earlier, each task also has a grading rubric. So you can see that here. Uh, this is how they will actually be graded at the competition by the judges. So, and each, each one has that in here. And it gives you a little more detail on the flight scenarios, the three flight scenarios. But we'll watch the video because it, it kind of gives you a better visual and makes it a little clearer. Uh, maintenance, troubleshooting, repair, same thing. We have a rubric for that. And the knowledge test, that's basically just going to be your score on the test between the two team members. And this, this one's a little, we'll have to watch the video to explain this a little bit better because you see it, basically they're describing a full UAS operation here. And it's kind of hard to visualize, visualize that without actually going out and doing it. But this is basically what we do here on a daily basis at Northland when we're flying missions for different projects we're doing. One thing I did want to point out is, interestingly, they have made it open a little bit for the types of drones you can have. So you are not tied to the Tello drone by any means or you know, going forward, these are these might come into play if we actually actually ever do some uh, outdoor flying with with a built drone. But they do give you the option to build your own, basically, if that's something you want to so choose. And that would, I'll be honest, a great way to teach the kids all about drone parts. And later on, we'll talk about some of the uh, resources Northland can offer for that. Uh, but they do have a couple stipulations, obviously. 3.5 pounds is the overall weight cutoff for any drone that would be in the competition. Interestingly, there are no limitations to the number of uh, rotors, okay, but they do have a size limit and they give you all the specs for the motor size. So you couldn't have a motor bigger than this. Uh, propellers also another big spec. Uh, so five inches would be your max propeller length and safety guards are almost always going to be required anywhere for any competition so of course in theirs they also require safety guards or prop guards we like to call them obviously safety glasses uh the containment area this is uh as we talked later but a little bit about the tellos uh and we show that obviously they make a drone arena one our game supplier pitsco very expensive not necessarily something you need though a uh, big thing is if you're working with two kids and maybe a couple of adults if everybody's wearing safety glasses and there's no spectators you don't really need a drone containment area or even if you still want to be extra safe it doesn't necessarily have to be a big old cage you could use a uh, just a simple net and hang it over a doorway anything that would separate you from uh, the crowd and the drone a uh, couple, and these are the videos that we're going to go to here in a second. And just quick, the flight scenario examples, you can see the actual game pieces that will be used. Uh, the first one, flight scenario one, you can actually see the little cones. And basically, you would fly the Tello and look for a specific letter and take a picture of it. Flight scenario two, a little bit different, you would be looking for a certain colored ball trying to find it basically and then flight scenario three is probably the toughest one where you're actually trying to land on these different pads and you can see that might be a little tricky and of course at the bottom of the 
uh, game guide. You can see all the important links you might need, and we'll be visiting some of these. Uh, Pitsco, the game supplier, like I said, uh, the FAA testing supplement to 107, and that pretty much covers the flight guide. So what I'm going to do now is go back to where we had the videos. And I'm going to go ahead and play. I'm going to first play the past one video here. This task includes three flight scenarios. We are going to show you some examples of how you might set up your course. In Flight Scenario 1, the objective is to utilize a drone to find hidden objects. The mission scenario is designed to simulate a real-world industry flight mission and tasks. The pilot will not be able to see any of the course being flown, so team communication will be a necessary component to successfully complete the scenario. All right, pitch forward. Y'all left. Roll that communication right. should utilize proper terminology by both the pilot and the observer during the mission. Your hidden objects can be under, between, or on top of some structure or object. In this example, the hidden object is a colored sticker inside a bucket and must be photographed by the drone. The color of the sticker corresponds to a landing pad that the operator must then navigate the drone to and land on. The observer will need to assist the pilot in locating the correct landing pad. In Flight Scenario 2, the objective is to find an object mixed in with similar objects. In this example, there are several colored balls on top of towers, but only one color is the target color. The drone will need to inspect, locate, and knock over the identified object, which is a colored ball in this example. We recommend you create an attachment for your drone to help with knocking over the balls in this scenario. During Flight Scenario 3, the objective is to fly to an object that is at least six feet or taller. The course includes many landing pads. Each of these landing pads has a different difficulty level. Flight skills are proven based on the pilot's ability to land the drone on less accessible landing pads, on smaller landing pads, and centered on the landing pads. The drone competition is open to many different types and brands of drones. Please make sure to read the specifications in the competition document to ensure your drone meets the requirements. For your hosted event, field elements will need to be available so proper judging of student flight operation can occur. In these videos, we have shown a few examples of those elements and the types of flight operations that can be displayed and judged. If you prefer to not create your own field elements, the field elements shown in the videos are available for purchase from Pitsco. A rubric will be used to score each of the teams as emerging, proficient, or expert and to assign points according to the skill levels displayed by the teams. Shown here are the standards that will be judged during the flight scenarios. Student teams will be judged on competency in operating small, unmanned air systems safely and effectively as a flight team. So, uh, like I said, uh, you'll notice that they showed a couple different model drones there. Uh, pretty much that task three, I'm looking at that one, and that to me is pretty much a tello. That's why you'll see the tellos involved a lot as far as the flying portion. And what I like about that is the tellos are fairly cheap for what you get. You can get a basic tello for about 100 bucks off of Amazon, and the EDU model, which is slightly better, it can be programmed more uh, for 100 about $130. So it's a very, very cheap drone for what it can do. And it's a very capable drone. Uh, I do want to kind of go through these other task videos because these are, these do a good job explaining the competition guide a little bit better than what the guide does. So. We're going to cover the required elements for task two, SUAS maintenance, troubleshooting, and repair. This falls under standard six. Standard six is worth 250 possible total points. 
each section has their own points of 0 to 40, 0 to 30, 0 to 18, and so on. A uh, score of 0 to 49 is no recognizable skill. 50 to 124 is emerging. 125 to 199 is proficient. 200 to 250 is considered expert. Each of these sections covers various topics from key airframe, hardware processing, and sensing components to wiring, correct polarity, location, and configuration. There's a brief instruction and scoring explanation before each section. So students will be allowed a certain amount of time to complete standard 6.1. There will be no cell phones or external internet access allowed during testing. Students will complete all testing on an individual basis. Standard 6.1 will auto-grade the students based on selecting the correct choices out of multiple choices. Scoring will be out of 40 possible points. The quiz will tell them they are going to match the component to the correct definition. It will show them a picture of the component, and they will be required to select the definition that best describes the component that they see. They will select their answer, click Next, and move through the quiz. 6.1 and 6.2 are both similarly set up as they select the definition that best matches the image shown. 6.3 through 6.7 will require the student to view a series of images of the multirotor. For the following examples, the students will need to select the answer that best describes what is wrong incorrect, broken, damaged, or missing in the images of the SUS. There will be a isometric view, a front view, a back view, a left view, a right view, a top view, and a bottom view of each frame. As the students look at the images, they will want to note for things such as missing landing gear, hardware on the motors, propeller orientation direction, wiring damage, wiring missing, wiring in the incorrect ports, incorrect polarity. They will view the images and then select the answer that best describes what is wrong in the images and then select next to move on to the next section. Section 6.8 through 6.12 will be multiple choice based off of a story problem. The students will view the story problem, read through the brief summary, then select the best answer. Say you are at a job site ready for takeoff. You arm the SUAS and take off. The aircraft begins to drift to the left without any transmitter input. What would be the most likely cause of the problem? You'll select the answer that fits best to that description, move on to the next question, and then submit their quiz. Okay, so as you can see, the maintenance is kind of uh, pretty, uh, pretty good. It actually matches uh, real world maintenance requirements. Uh, task three, we won't talk about because that's pretty well a basic uh, part 107 test, essentially. Task four is a, the full mission cycle planning one. So we'll kind of look at that one real quick. Welcome to task four of autonomous flight and mapping. This task includes a flight scenario and is broken into two sections. Of course, you're familiar with the standards. They'll be tested in two different places, one with a quiz that'll be uploaded based on the scenario. And the second part will be your documentation and work that's uploaded and scored from there. So let's talk about the format. First, your team will open and read through the directions that were emailed to you from your survey partner. It may be easiest to print the directions off for ease of reference. The surveyor will be asking for an autonomous flight to be planned and a map to be created from the data collected. You need to be careful this is not an easy flight or an easy location and the weather may be a little challenging. After briefly discussing the project and doing some research, using all the resources available, your team will need to open the testing portion of the task and complete to the best of your ability. You can use the internet and other resources for this part of the competition. Now, what do you need to have available? Remember, all the notes, planning, and scratch paper will be needed, need to be scanned and uploaded. These will be included in your team's final scoring. You also, in some cases, be asked to complete the process of creating an orthomosaic map using a photogrammetry process, and will definitely need to understand that process. 
After completing the task and creating the deliverable that is required, your team will finalize the quiz and then upload your results. You may need some specialized software for some of these tasks. We understand that this would be a very challenging task even for a, the most experienced drone pilot. But remember, we're looking for the best display of skills in your state to represent at the national competition. We challenge you to learn from this experience and see what types of skills that your team may be missing so next year or when you get to the national competition, you'll be ready. Good luck and as always, fly safe. Okay, so that's kind of a pretty quick wrap up of uh, all the task areas and I pretty well explained. I'm seeing a lot of uh, chat on Obviously, this competition is probably going to change a little bit, as Jessa mentioned in the chat. Uh, this was all done for a virtual year. Obviously, we're starting to come out of the whole COVID thing now, so not quite sure exactly how this will look going forward. Uh, I, I imagine it will be more in person and more. I'm not sure if they would continue to use the LMS. I, I assume they would because it seems to be a, a lot of work put into building that, so I don't see why they wouldn't still use it, but there may be some more actual up close and judging as far as maintenance tasks. I'm not sure. We'll we'll find out more about that as the new year approaches, I'm sure. Um, I'm also seeing a lot of, can everybody see that? Well, actually, let me do this first. So like I said, that was the manual, basically, uh, the next place we're going to go to is the Pitsco shop because we're also getting a lot of equipment price type questions. So next place we'll go is there. And you'll see, just like any education provider, they typically like to, they like to get their cut too. Uh, we generally don't like to pay full price for things. So you'll, you'll notice they have lots of packages here for Tellos that are quite a bit more expensive than what you can do on your own, in my opinion. Uh, depending on your funding, I mean, some schools get Perkins funding. They do offer a great curriculum with that Mind's Eye drone that we were talking about, but it, that's a very expensive drone, uh, and it's not necessarily needed. And you'll see down here, the drone arena, almost $1,400 here for this. Again, this is not something that is needed. If you're flying these small indoor drones, this is something that the state will actually provide at the competition, the actual competition. No need to go out and buy this kind of stuff. Same with the, the field elements. Those are 500 by themselves. Depending on your situation, like I said, uh, if you're a school and you have some good grant funding, definitely you can't go wrong with buying this drone curriculum because it's definitely geared towards the competition and the skills that are gonna be assessed. Uh, just to give you an example here on the left here, they're selling an EDU drone five pack for $1,100. We could probably do that for less than 500 on Amazon. So just to give you an idea. So there's definitely no reason to get stuck on their uh, prices and getting things you don't really need. Um, one thing I will point out as, as you go down, they'll they'll give you some resources on, I'm gonna actually show you the you read their, basically how they build their drone cage and their field elements. If you, and that gives you a complete part list here. And you'll notice this, it's all basically just PVC pipe and fittings. Okay, so they're trying to charge you, as an example, we'll go down to the drone cage here. These are the game pieces. Down here's the drone cage. You'll see the different, it gives you all the specs, you know, what you need. And netting, bungee cords, all that. You see, they'll even give you the PVC sizes up here. Uh, what, what type of P, PVC, how many pieces, the length, all that. So you could just probably go to Home Depot or one of those stores and instead of spending $1,300, you could probably build your own cage if you really wanted to for, probably less than a couple hundred. So there's definitely options out there. And like I said, the cage, having a cage is not really a huge requirement, especially if you're working with a small group of kids. 
even if you had multiple teams, like say you had three teams, six kids, as long as everybody is focused on the drone flying, there's really no reason to have netting. Many times uh, these little tello drones especially can be flown in the classroom as long as there's a little bit of separation between where you're, where the pilot and the, the um, bystanders are and where the drone's actually flying. These are very good little drones, easy to control. So, and they're fairly safe. I mean, you can, they're not gonna hurt anybody really bad. So, and especially if you're wearing safety glasses. And one thing I always like to mention is ponytails also, whenever you're doing flight operations, anybody with long hair should definitely have their hair in a ponytail. Uh, oh, I see a quick question here about batting cage. Yeah, you could use batting cage netting. I, I forget what kind of netting we looked at. There's act, I would use the smallest, cheapest netting you could get because we're talking about really small drones here. They're, they're not going to go through any type of netting. So like I said, that could be your, you could build a basic cage just by running a net across the open door and putting the kids on one side and let the drone fly on the other side. So it can be something that simple. So let's go back to the PowerPoint. So that, that's kind of your general resources. Uh, like I said, this year's competition, I don't know if this will change going forward, but the way it's set now, really you could get by. The only thing you really have to have the cheapest way you could get into this is a tello and that's all you need and the rest of the resources we'll talk about as far as what how we can help and cat uh, probably the biggest thing we do what what started us into uh before we became the national center for autonomous technology is drone tech our original project and basically this was back in 2013 we were funded to basically introduce drone education into schools, K through 12 and into uh, two-year colleges. Okay, so we've been at this for a little while. Obviously, when we first got started, there wasn't a whole lot. There was no such thing as a tello or none of that. It was, it was very hard to find any actual kits. So back then, most people typically pieced together their own drones, uh, you know, by going out to whatever sites were out there that would talk about drones. And that's basically what we did also at first. But uh, three big areas that where we can help you as far as NCAT is workshops and certification. Basically, we like to, we, we run educator workshops. And once you go through one of our workshops, we, we will work with you to actually get you certified as a drone tech partner. Meaning wherever you're at, you could be out in North Carolina, Florida, wherever you would be qualified to be a drone tech provider. And what that does is that we give you all the curriculum you need and we, we even have some equipment loaner options that would help you out. We also do uh, some professional development. And what we'll do is we'll go to the NCAT website here, show you a little bit about what's out there. Get rid of that one. So this is our NCAT website. Uh, in addition, it, this is all things autonomous, so we're, obviously we're kind of focused on drones today, but there's definitely a whole lot more out here than just drones. We're partnered up with uh, the, the marine side out in uh, California and the, the uh, automated vehicle side out in Michigan. Okay, so there's a whole lot going on. Uh, the mate, which is out in California, you can see some of the pictures here. They have a whole competition on their own that you can actually get into. It's pretty in depth. It's actually worldwide, pretty neat. We're uh, hoping to get that up here in Minnesota pretty soon so that we can uh, you know, take advantage of that. And just another uh, resource for the kids and for learning autonomous. But you'll see as you scroll down, kind of have to scroll all the way at the bottom here. Uh, I can click on events. We can see some of our upcoming events here. And not just here at Northland, but all over the country. So this will give you, like today's event, you can see is right there. Uh, some different events, not just us, but the the uh, the sea. And we like to call ourselves Airland Sea. 
And the one Thursday, the next event we have is a webinar on Thursday with Steve. He'll be talking about drones and he's kind of getting back into the, the whole flight process and the imagery and geospatial analysis, flight planning type stuff and the post processing, which kind of is an add on to our basic uh, build and drone uh, maintenance course. Then I don't see, oh, here we go. Wanted to point out a couple here. Uh, getting to this particular event, we have an actual educator workshop that's kind of geared towards this already. It kind of brings you through the full cycle of it. So we, what we basically do is we take a drone kit and we build it up from scratch as we go through all the parts and how they work together. Uh, this typically will spend about two days building it, testing it out, disassembling it. And on the third day, we'll come in with the STEM drone, the Tello in this case, and we'll go through on how to fly this. So we'll get our flight practice with the Tellos and we'll learn how to code them just a little bit, you know, how they can be used that way autonomously. And it's pretty intensive uh, three-day workshop. It's We have two scheduled right now, one at the end of July, the last week in July here, the 26th through the 28th. That one's going to be in Fletcher College in uh, Louisiana. Okay. Right now we're limited to about 15. Typically on these, we're limited to about 15 people at a time. Uh, I do know we're holding about five seats for some specific instructors down there in uh, Louisiana. But as far as I know, there's probably still some open slots for that one. So if you're anywhere near New Orleans, Louisiana in that area, and you think you can make it, Go ahead and register and we'll see you there. As far as a uh, home station here, you'll notice immediately after we get back, we're hosting, oh, this is the STEM camp. Uh, this is also at Fletcher. So this is after we do the educator workshop, typically we will run a two day student camp or STEM camp, we call it. It's just a very condensed version of the educator workshop where we're focused more on getting the drones in the kids' hands and how to, build and fly real quick. Uh, the week after we get back from Fletcher in August, you'll notice the one on the right over here. That's here at Northland at the aerospace campus. And I do believe there's still some open slots for that one. So that'll be the August 4th through 6th right here at Northland, the three-day educator workshop. There will be more events coming. We will be working with Skills USA to attend some of their, at least here in Minnesota, to attend some of their um, different leadership se seminars and see how we can help train. We're definitely always available and road ready. Uh, so if there's organizations out there, like like Fletcher did with us, like say somebody in Florida or North Carolina, even get a couple schools together and say, hey, we would like to get this drone tick. There's potential there where we might be able to come down and if you're the host, willing to be the host institution, come down and actually run a educator workshop. Okay, Def definitely need some lead time on that. Um, but yeah, many, many different events and it's constantly updating. Uh, we have many more, I'm sure, <laughs> coming. But going back to where we just were, probably the most important thing and the thing I like the most is the resources. So you click on that one. And we just have, the, and this changes daily. I mean, there's constantly things being added to this area. Um, you'll see, and many, all of our, any webinars or any uh, workshops that we've done all end up in here. Like the one we're doing today will actually end up in here. So but you'll see some of our past ones. So if I'm a high school, we did a great seminar on how to start a drone program. Uh, all kinds of stuff, uh, workshop resources, all kinds of drone stuff here that you can see. Um, what am I looking for? Course outlines and materials. This is where we will actually provide, there's already a bunch of free stuff out here. Okay, and these are all basically different colleges that were sponsored by NSF on projects. And one of the things about NSF is we have to provide the deliverables that we say. For instance, the drone tech, uh, we ourselves are actually providing uh, course materials for the part 107 and the drone maintenance, small UAS maintenance. And these are courses that could easily be adapted to your high school or even middle school throughout the year to, and they'll actually go through all these areas. And, but these are just a couple 
some of them, you know, thrown safety. Uh, some of them apply, some don't apply, obviously, but all of ours will end up in this area. And what we're waiting on is for our project to close out so we can actually upload these through the ATE system and they'll eventually be on the NCAT website here like everything else. But uh, they are available now if needed. We, uh, we have them here at Northland. Uh, at the end of the slideshow, you'll see I left some contact information for myself and for Zach Nicklin, our uh, UAS director. So that, that will be there. So anybody who needs any of our curriculum or any of the materials that we currently have that are haven't been uploaded into the uh, NCAT website here, we can definitely get those to you. Like I said, these are full college credit level courses. All I think they're all three credits that can easily be used throughout a year, maybe two years, starting in a middle school, high school type scenario. So you're not starting from scratch necessarily. Um, grant resources, another great place. Uh, a lot of times it's all about the money. And I know a lot of people know about, um, and this is more of the NSF type stuff, but there are many, many resources out there like Perkins that most of you probably already know about. We ourselves, as far as professional development, talking about a seminars, we actually offer professional development credits through the state of Minnesota. Different states have different requirements, but uh, we offer for every course we teach, actual workshop, we offer a basic credit equivalency. Uh, one thing I like to mention as far as uh, professional development, we are... I know travel costs and all that kind of thing can be a, a detriment to trying to attend some of these workshops, like for instance, in August, the one here at Northland. NCAT is definitely uh, able to help out in that situation. So typically, like say you wanna attend the workshop in August, you, you definitely make all your travel arrangements come up here. We can reimburse up to $1,000 to help offset that. So that, that's a great, one of the great things we can do as NCAT help out with that kind of stuff because not everybody has the all the professional development funds they need to to do everything all the cool stuff like that uh, but i think i'm gonna pause here for a minute so we can get some general questions in there if, if there's any so any general questions and i'll go ahead and let you on unmute since it looks like we're we're only about 19 participants so i think we can handle a little bit of back and forth here was there any questions on like the ncat resources and what we can do looks like steve's doing a great job in the chat room and between him and jess so keeping everybody and like I said, all of this materials, the slideshow, the links, everything will be available after the webinar. They'll be posted immediately to our NCAT website where we just were. Uh, and to give you an idea, these, these are a couple, these are the two build drone tech educator workshops that we talked about on the NCAT website. This one on the left is the one in uh, Louisiana, and this is the one here at Northland. Maybe more to come as we go forward. I'm expecting in the fall we'll probably get a little busy in September, October, trying to go to different schools and stuff. To and as far as Minnesota goes, we're probably going to try to run some regional competitions. Uh, as far from what I can understand out of the Skills USA, there there only seems to be a state and then a national competition type setup. But there's nothing stopping you. Which we're going to do is at least organizing some different regional competitions, much like uh, Vex Robotics does it. And you don't necessarily have to have it specifically like that, the, you know, with all the official game pieces in the drone cage, you can just kind of focus on the skill areas using that, the rubrics. Uh, and I don't know if they would make the LMS available for regional competitions or not. That's something I would probably have to find out. I would hope they would, but it, to me, the way it seems is they're planning on doing the only at the state and the national type competitions as far as the LMS operation, but I don't know that for sure. 
I have a question. Sure, go ahead. Yeah, so this is Jacob Spute from uh, Quinnebog Valley Community College. So I was wondering on the photogrammetry stuff, do you have any resources for like open source or publicly available uh, photogrammetry stuff, anything you'd recommend? Actually, I'm gonna go ahead and let Steve and our geospatial specialist answer that real quick. Steve? Yeah, yeah I, I know there are several for free. I've tried various ones. I haven't really found one that I like. I was wondering if you have uh, <laughs> any that you'd recommend. Uh, not that I'd really recommend because we've been, unfortunately we've been using PIX4D mostly for our processing. So, and that's like with the stitching and that. So it, I think I've heard you can use ARC to stitch, I haven't tried that, so I can't really recommend it. Um, but some of my students have, have used ARC to stitch. Um, but the other, just bringing the imagery in, if it's a, a single still image, it should import right in. So I assume you're talking about the stitching, that's the part you're, you're wanting to create mosaics, right? Yeah, that's correct, Cor correct, right. So uh, for, for context, I'll work on revamping a, drone thing in Connecticut for community colleges and part of it is trying to like it's funded by NASA we're going with like the the Mars drone stuff and so we're trying to do things that don't rely on uh GPS stuff right that are, are more local so like getting the pictures and stitching them back together into sort of 3D images is good um and I, I've had success with some of that stuff with uh some various 3D scanning things that are more focused, but the photogrammetry for coming from drone imagery, I haven't really found anything that works great. So we might just have to pay for something. The, the appeal of the open source is that it does give students a chance more to mess around with the internals of the system and maybe get a little bit deeper into it um, if you know they have the technical skills to, to do that. Uh, but yeah, the... I agree with that. I, I try to find freeware all the time. In fact, most of my stuff I start out when I start out teaching the uh, uh, imagery and geospatial stuff, I start them out on Google Earth Pro because it's free and you can teach the fundamentals of it all in Google Earth. Then you can go on to the bigger software. But I'll do some looking around and I'll try and get back to you if you want to send me your, I should, you should have your email. So I can look yeah. that up. I'll see what I can find for uh, free software. I'll get a list up for you. Yeah, and we have funding, so we can pay for PIX4D for student teams if we need to or whatever. But it's just it's it's more about the educational like ability to get in there because part of it's like we're not using just a set kit while you do stuff with it. Like they're designing parts of the drone system. They're designing mm -hmm. some of the circuitry stuff. So trying to get them to be able to touch more of the system. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, thanks, Steve. And uh, guys kind of leading us into where we're heading next is the kind of what we always call the virtual happy hour. So, but real quick, I wanted to point out the contact information here. So you got all my information here, my email. Also, Zach Nicklin, who's our UAS program manager. Uh, so he he's definitely more on the drone operation side, where I'm more on the maintenance side. And then Steve. I should have put his contact in. He's the moderator, is our geospatial uh, analyst specialist. So uh, he's actually hosting a seminar in on Thursday. So you'll if, hopefully most of you registered for that, or you can register if you haven't yet. He, he'll be doing a short webinar on th this Thursday, talking about basically drones and geospatial applications. But like I said, looks like we are few people have dropped out of the room but uh now is a great time to just if anybody has questions or wants to ask more specific things feel free to hang out and we can talk anything drones or geospatial and if if you if you've got all the info you need feel free to go we're we're definitely anytime you can get an early day out of a zoom meeting is a good thing so uh, yeah so go ahead and fire away if anybody has questions or wants to give some input
right? It's like a pretty quiet crowd, probably killed you with the, the speed presentation there. Are uh, you, fam oh, are you familiar ahead. with the Minnesota space grant funded drone thing that they've done, the quadcopter? Um, so the, oh, what's it called? So it's the Minnesota Space Grant Consortium Quadcopter Challenge. You know, there's so many of those things out there. I've, I've probably come across it because at different times there's, I've, through different states, I uh, actually have a lot of different types of drone competitions I've looked at. Uh, so I don't remember that one specifically, but I don't doubt that they have one. Do you remember what kind of drone it was involved with? Uh, the, I mean, they were using a DJI frame for some of what they were doing, like an F450 or something. Um, and they, they were, I can, I can post a link to the challenge in chat. So that's, oh, yeah. that, awesome. that, that's the one I'm talking about where they had a number of, uh, resources with various stuff. So I, I, I just thought since this was like related to Minnesota, that there might be some crossover slash collaboration but um yeah i just i don't remember that one specifically um i know we do we have uh, worked with uh the rad competition i don't know if you've heard of that one the robotics aerial drone competition i i haven't no it's basically the same people who run vex robotics are you familiar with that Okay, yeah. So I think it's it's yeah. I, I know about Vex. Uh, there's sort of a high school college right. split, I think, on on yeah. some of this stuff. Yeah, we worked with them. Like we actually held the Rad Minnesota Rad State Championship last year, or prior to COVID. Right, about two months prior to when the COVID hit. So I guess that was January 2020. We actually held a state competition and. It was really great. It's the Parrot Mambo drone. The only thing we didn't like about it is they basically forced you into one game supplier, much like Vex does. And these little Parrot Mambo drones that were costing us $150 all, all of a sudden went up to about $400 this year. And we absolutely, yeah. we did not like that because that's way too much money to pay for something that small that can, you know, you could go through a couple of them a year. You know what I mean? Yeah, the yeah the the price on this stuff definitely is is some of like what you what you're managing and what yeah what we're trying to do is trying to give people flexibility to choose their own like flight controllers and their own other stuff and kind of right. put stuff together, but the timing gets a little bit tricky as far as when you order stuff and when people have stuff to yeah. to work on it and that so um, yeah and and that's something I've run into myself with different classes I love to order do kit our own kit type thing. But what I found, like you said, is I decide I'm going to get this kit and try to find all the components. Now there's 400 other people that had the same thought. So there's a run on like motors or there's a run on certain ESCs. It can be very tricky to piece together your own kit. Yeah. Yeah. And, and a lot of times now, especially now, it seems like you can't really build a drone cheaper than what you can buy a whole drone kit for. Yeah, that's, that's definitely... Yeah, it's it's yeah, it's tough. Yeah, hopefully that'll change with you know shipping will get better with whatever's going on and you know yeah because I know I'm still waiting on drones that I ordered like three months ago. Yeah, it's just it's frustrating. All right, well, thanks. I, this was helpful for me at least. Um, I've got. Some people I'm meeting with later this week and then kicking off in June with some students doing summer research trying to put stuff together so. And you said uh, you were with, with the college right? Yeah I'm with Quinnebog Valley Community College. One, one uh, thing I'll, 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 I'll have to uh, I don't have the link on me right now but the one thing I'll have you look up is uh, a company called NXP just just uh, google NXP hover games drone. Okay. That is a drone that's actually built for universities. It's a kit, basically, and it's a competition that they do every year for, and it's geared towards co two-year colleges and universities. It's a very comprehensive, and we actually base our UAS maintenance course here on that drone. Okay. Yeah, that's that's a good lead. Yeah. Yep. I mean, I've, 
I've got some stuff already sort of locally from previous stuff we've done and things that we're going to have students start around playing with, but that's definitely a thing that I might. Yeah, yeah. it's pretty reasonable in my opinion for what you get. It's about a $500 kit, which is not crazy, but what I like about it is it's all open sourced and it can be added to, it's built for that. It's built to do where the students would add on their own functions, depending on what they're trying to do with the task like add on a thermal, you know, stuff like that. Right, right, yeah. And and it, so it lets you modify the firmware and all that good stuff? Oh yeah, yeah, you yeah. do everything. You you program the flight controller. Cool. And it's a universal flight controller. That's what I like. It can, it could actually be used for a vehicle or even a submersible. So you have to program it specifically for your drone. <laughs> But, they, but there's great resources. They offer a, basically a whole free ebook on how to do every part of the task. So it, it's very well supported. Is that NXP one pretty similar to the Parallax one that used to be out a few years back? Oh, no, no. This one's way, way more advanced. Okay. Yeah. So we still actually use the Parallax kits for just the basic build, but they don't make them anymore. Yeah, I know. I was, I was looking at getting those a few years ago. Um, I was talking to John Beck. I actually served with John and Zach and all those guys and Steve actually. And I kind of uh, looked into that and then they no longer made them. So we're just still trying to find other options. Right. There are, there are other kits out there that are comparably priced that NXP for kids. I think that would be a little bit too much depending. I mean, I like a, maybe with high school students, I would try it. But any any younger than that, I, I definitely wouldn't recommend that one. <laughs> yeah, I teach teach high school tech ed and like looking at, you know, it would be like we, we would get like one of those kind of a thing, you know, mm -hmm. to kind of demonstrate on, but the students probably wouldn't end up actually working on the one device. It would just be to kind of show more components and right. learn more about the systems. They probably wouldn't be flying it or anything. So no, we do still have a lot of those uh parallax kits. So I probably have close to 25 of those. So we, we can lend those out. You know, once, once we train you up on it, we, we could lend those out. And they still have a great, uh, their whole resource website out there as far as the academics of it. They, they are keeping that up and running forever as far as I know. So, and it's a great resource. Yeah, we use the Parallax kit as well, um, and we're moving off of it because it's no longer available, right? Um, right. But... And, and drones have kind of changed quite a bit since that kit came out. Yeah. I mean, they were like one, I think the first kit that I knew about that you could actually buy. Yeah, we've been kind of with them since we started Drone Tech. Yeah, we kind of did a couple of those. Have you heard of the, was it Flown open source one? Have you heard of that? What, what's it called? It's called Flown, like oh, F-L-O-N-E. No. Um, well, we, we built um, one of those like two years ago. It's basically like laser cut plywood and foam and stuff. And then uh, you have to build everything else yourself, put the, you know, the autopilot and all that stuff built into it. So it's pretty cool. Right. Yeah. There, I mean, there's a couple good uh, websites. I haven't been on them in a while, but uh, like Ardu Pilot trying to remember some of the other ones. There's a bunch of good do-it-yourself uh, drone sites out there that have tons of resources and different ideas for building on your own. But like I was talking about earlier, it's it's kind of hit and miss as far as components nowadays. <laughs> you know, it, it's very frustrating if I want to build a drone and I can't get motor this type of motor for a while or whatever. And have, have you guys, you know, done anything with, uh, I know there's been some push for, you know, you know, at least down, down where I'm at, they did some stuff with, uh, like, you know, micro drone racing stuff too. You guys we, don't, done... we don't ourselves get it, but we're, we're starting to get involved with the, the drone racing people down in Minneapolis area. Yeah. They hydro quite, hydro quite... FPV or something like that. Yeah. Hydra, I think is. Hydra, yeah. 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 We're definitely getting involved with them. Because we're trying to start uh, like a drone racing slash just drone team club here at, at the high school I work at, and we're just I mean we have we have tellos and we got about I think eight of them, um, and we're just trying to kind of figure out what uh, where to go like what to <laughs> what would be a good starting point 
to kind of just make Are you going to use the Tellos for drone racing? No, not there. There's too much lag with those yeah, you know, yeah. Wi-Fi controlled and stuff. So, um, I mean, we do, we do, we, we race them around in the classroom a little bit, but not yeah. so much, not, not so much fast, you know? So now have you seen those micro? Yeah. The tiny whoops and stuff. Yeah. 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 That's yeah and that's we... kind of what, like, we, we don't really know what to, where to start, like to, in order to get into that. So, um, oh. tried to work more with the, with Hydra and those yeah, guys. Yeah. That would be there. a good people to talk to. Yeah, they've been kind of hard to get a hold of lately with uh, COVID stuff and all that. So, but, well, let me uh, let me talk to some people. What's your? Uh, let's see. Just shoot me a, a a chat text with that that you're looking for more information from Hydra, and I'll I'll make sure we get back to you on that because we, we have uh, some good contacts with them. And then I think we're getting ready to work on some type of project with them for curriculum around based okay. around the racing drones. Yeah, because, you know, we're just trying to kind of get into, you know, multiple things. And, you know, we've, we've been talked about, um, I know, like at Egan High School, one of the schools in our district, they actually do a whole part 107 uh, class and get everyone, you know, right. their aviation kids go through and get all that stuff. Um, we've talked about adding like, like doing like a crash course kind of in part 107 and yeah. you know, as, as kind of a lead into getting kids into the drone dr like a drone club where we do all kinds of things from racing to you know right. try and get involved in the skills usa and all that and stuff so that's and that's one reason i like skills usa so much is it's really geared towards getting them certified in an actual career path yeah i just i've got to go and get mine this summer here at some point <laughs> i'll work on finishing that yeah, so yeah, I can definitely see a kid by the time they're before they're graduated should be a full drone pilot and then get credit depending on how they did it with uh, like a program like ours for small UAS operations. We could probably give them credit if we work together like that kind of thing. We're definitely interested in that. Uh, one, one other question kind of about like um, using, you know, the drones in schools and, you know, I'm sure you're probably aware of how um, difficult schools can be sometimes dealing with you know piloting devices with cameras that are flying around right um do you, have you guys do you guys have any sort of like uh, i don't know like, like agreements or anything like like previous experience with getting this so like my school board will be like just fine with us with us using these or like i don't know what resources for that kind of a thing are out there you don't i don't know if you even know, know what i'm saying but it's no, I know what you're saying. Uh, the old parallaxes, we, we used to have to fly those inside, especially here in Minnesota. Yeah. Those were a tough sell to get into the building sometimes because, I mean, they were so big and when they crash, they crash. And so we had to have all kinds of safety netting and all that, and make sure everything was okay and get permission. But from what I, my past educator workshops, what most of them said is they pretty much had a direct approach to their administrations individually and yeah belt them out what, what they were comfortable with yeah and like i had to talk with my administration and basically just get them to know that like you know when we're flying these inside of a building like they, they were all worried about you know faa and part 107 and all this stuff right. like, we're flying these in a classroom right we're inside of a building um and as far as i am I, I understand there are no requirements with faa or anything for flying inside of a building right right <clears throat> Okay. Yeah. But here's here's a better one. The the little drones we've been talking about, the Telos specifically, yeah. those are all just uh, small enough where they require no FAA registration. They're pretty much considered a toy. Yeah, e even outside. Yeah, exactly. Yep, even outside, and they're so safe and small that I I can't imagine any administration would have a hard time with, other than making may maybe making sure that there's a net or something in between the kids and the drone yeah and i i fly them around in my classroom we don't, we don't use a net i, I have the cages <clears throat> on the actual drones like the full the big prop guards right um, that, that work really well and we've never had any issues so right yeah i've never really had any i've had like 15 of them flying around before yeah. in a hangar now most most of the kids are pretty good and they're easy to control that's the reason i like them and in the one one i have one last question about the um, using the Tellos for Skills USA, um, when they're talking about the programming stuff on there, like, are is there any sort of 
I mean, I, I know like it sounds like this year the only it's just like the piloting portion or for flying them is just for the um, you know, it's basically like not really coding them or whatever, but is right. is the is the idea that like in the future the the programming portion of it or the autonomous portion will be like using like Python and stuff to code, or are they just talking about using like that drone blocks thing or or what? That, that's kind of hard to say because the the program the problem with the Tello is is that's not like the type of drone where you can use what they were talking about as fly as far as flying a mission path, right? Collecting data that the Tello is not meant for that, right? So that would be a whole different type of drone with GPS and everything. Yeah, so that's why I was kind of wondering, like, the, is there any thought as to like what would be? I know, like next year they're still talking about doing everything just you know virtual or whatever for that portion, but is there any idea of like what they would go towards on something like that? Like what type of a device? Would it be one of those um, mind's eye drones or? That's kind of what, how it, they're, they're basically have it all geared around that mind's eye drone. Okay. I, I think in their mind, ideally you would get that mind's eye drone and these are pretty expensive. I want to say that they were like $1,500 a piece. Yeah, and yeah, exactly. That's where. And, this That's thing hurdle here, you know, built as a kid, obviously has fully functional GPS. Uh, another neat thing about it is it can be reduced or expanded in size, depending on yeah. how big you want it to be. So ideally, I think they think that that one could be fl flown on the indoor part <laughs> and used it down the road for actually going out and flying a mission. And I'm not sure if they're going to go there. <clears throat> I would assume they would eventually. Yeah, I, th I think typically how, how it was explained is Skills USA introduces a competition like this, and they give it like a three-year probation. Okay. To see if there's some traction, and if not, they'll kind of cancel it. If there is, then yeah, Tom. Oh, got Tom, you here, Justin. Yeah, Tom's right. So when we're talking about this kind of on a national scale, the national office has formed those partnerships with Pitsco and Crossflight and Mind's Eye and all of that. And so what, what the national side is saying is for national competition that would take place every June, that's where you, ideally, you'd have a Mind's Eye drone and you'd do all that. But those are very expensive. And so on the state level, we've been trying to figure out here in Minnesota how to run this less expensively so that more schools can get involved. Um, because what I'm finding is a lot of schools in our state who are getting into drone programming tend to, they have a little bit more money in their district and we wanna make this more accessible to as many schools as possible. So ultimately at the state level, we may run our, our programming just slightly with, with slight variations just to allow for more accessibility, knowing that anybody who would ultimately go on to national competition at the state level as an organization, we would utilize our partners to help facilitate you know, getting the equipment needed um, to be able to to be competitive at a high level, if that makes sense. No, that you're you're right yeah. on there. Yeah, that I think the the ideal situation would be a school that bought the all the curriculum, the complete drone curriculum from Pitsco, had the Mind's Eye drone, and had the Tello. That would be the perfectly equipped team there. As you saw from the video, they were actually basing the maintenance test on the mind's eye drone. So you would definitely have an advantage there. Alrighty, so any other questions or well, any other topics you want to talk about? I don't think so. I saw Kathy had just posted a question about the, the Tello Bluetooth controllers, which I have had really poor luck using those. Yeah, that's one of the... <laughs> I haven't, to be honest with you, I haven't played around because typically what we do is we're only playing with them for like a half a day, a full day, and we're using, we're just using the Wi-Fi. So I haven't really messed with the Bluetooth stuff. 
Yeah, I've, so, I've had, oh, sorry, go ahead. I was gonna say, so do you use Wi-Fi controllers? Um, no, the, no, no, the Tello I, is Wi-Fi. I yeah. use, I use the, the Bluetooth controller to connect to the phone or whatever device you're controlling. You yeah. Know, simply with Wi-Fi. But like the, there's that Tello um, FPV. It's like a third party app that you can buy. Oh, yeah. for like, I think it's That's like cool. $6 or something like that. Oh, I and, see what you're talking and about. It, and it lets you use any Bluetooth controller, not just how the Tello requires you to use just that GameSir controller. Yeah. So like if you have like Xbox controllers, like even from like, I don't know if you have like a first robotics team at your school, they probably all have a Xbox Bluetooth controllers um, anyway. And like we, I've just used those and had much better luck with not okay. having to interfere and all that stuff. So yeah, we just have yeah, the games that, or controllers here that we use. I, I noticed that if we use the iPads and we spread out more, they work better, but that's kind of difficult to do. They have to be, you know, at least 10, 15 feet apart and then they kind of don't interrupt each other, but. Yeah, it's yeah, one of the, the problem with that. limits of Bluetooth is really what it comes down to there. Yeah. Yeah, that's one knock I have against the Tellos is they're, they're definitely hard to get more than a couple of them in the same area. Um, yeah. this, is, this is kind of a random weird solution, but like um, I've, I've, I have used them with um, like Android tablets. Like that I had- Yeah, I use the Android, Android tablets. And then um, like plugging off like the, you know, the micro USB port off the bottom. You can get an adapter that goes from that to like a USB connection, like a, like a okay. USB email. And then I plugged in controllers that way. And then you can oh. put Bluetooth all together. I mean, mind you, you have to have, a, you know, Android devices that you can plug in those cables to, but, but I've had that work and I've actually used like old, like just old corded Xbox 360 controllers to control it. And that worked really well. Okay. I'll try that. Sounds cool. And so, then my other question was, um, you know, we were building the flame wheel F four fifties and sometimes there's struggle to get to work, but, um, we got them to work and then now they're stacking up in the classroom because we build them. So I'm wondering if other people build these, do you like take them apart after, or what do you do with them after? They are kids. You know, after you build like the drone, you know? Well, what we do since we reuse them is we, I've built into the curriculum where once they're built and we've finished everything we're doing with them, I have also a disassembly plan. Okay. So I use the students I to disassemble them. Okay. So I'm not doing it all by myself. Right. Okay. That sounds like a good plan. Looking for a link I have somewhere, uh, talking, going back to the tele, have you guys been to the drone pilot forums? No. I got to find the link here. The, the rise forums, like on... No, this is for all drones, basically, but there is a specific Tello uh, branch. Is that on, where is that hosted? Like, is it on uh, I'm looking for the, or? Of course, when I need some, to find something real quick, I don't have it. I have this whole list of links that I was, I haven't been there in a while, but it's, it's basically each type of drone, whether it be a Parrot or a Tello or even a Phantom, they all have their own specific forums and they are just full of good information on all kinds of issues that people have had yeah. and let me just google it here you know one suggestion i used this semester that worked really well because i've used it in the past and it didn't but it's the drone blocks where you can program with like um block programming and if you use like the web app instead of the app that you download it does actually work on those tele drones pretty okay so yeah i actually we have uh, drone blocks ourselves Right on. Yeah, I use that through Chrome. That works. That works really well. I use that yes. in my engineering classes. Yeah. Okay, I'm put. I'm putting the link in the chat here. So it's called dronepilots.community. Okay. Thanks. And let's see if I can share that. And you see here, this is kind of their homepage here. It's all different if you go to the bottom you'll see all the different uh types of drones that, that are supported here and if you go to tello it'll bring you to the general home page and there are there is a bunch of information here i mean they're doing oh, crazy cool. stuff here yeah i mean you have you have people who have figured out how to do facial recognition of like a basketball team using a tello yeah, actually, um, 
going back to that, like we've gotten the Python code to work and DJI actually sent me to their um, GitHub site and they have that code there too. Like the oh, Python man. code for image recognition and then, yep. um, you know, controlling the telos and stuff like that. Yeah, like what I know awesome. is a lot of the people involved on, on this, on these forums are actually like professors and uh, like MIT students, people like oh, that. Cool. So they have done a lot of crazy things with this drone. And pretty much any type of problem or hardware, or anything like that is on here somewhere. Right on, Control that's awesome. What, yeah, it's more, a great resource. One more Tello thing. Have you guys had any any issues with just using the regular Tellos versus the Tello EDUs? I the EDUs have regular. that bigger API, so you can do the image recognition, where the old Tellos, you can't do image recognition and stuff. Yeah, I have both. And I've been and told I... that you can't upgrade the old a the old Tellos to that API, so that was the only difference I found. Yeah. I, I, and this sounds, sounds odd, but I've had like better durability <laughs> with the EDU ones, which doesn't seem to make any sense, oh. but okay. I don't know. I've like both, of, I've both of my old Tellos um, motors broke and whatever in the first couple of days and my EDUs are still running strong. So who knows? Oh. The, the main difference on the EDU is the software data kit. Yeah. Basically more programmability into the higher languages. Whereas the basic Telos can only be block programmed. No, you can program it with Python. You can do that. It just doesn't yeah. have the biggest API. Like it doesn't have like the, where you can control the cam. I mean, like the right. image recognition camera and stuff like that. But you yeah, can still do the Python. On it. Basically, yeah. it's just a lot more capable. And it's really only a few dollars more, like $30, I think. Right. So definitely worth it. I've I've got a bunch of them. I'm still waiting on about twenty of them on order here. Right on. Yeah, I, I personally am going to use the EDUs for all the workshops and stuff. Yeah, I've done like lots of competitions with them, and they're really great. I love them. Yeah, it's a cool little drone. I just wish they would uh, fix some of the. I don't like Wi-Fi drones in general. <laughs> yeah, agreed. Yeah, yeah, it just makes me mad when the controller won't connect and you're sitting there. And sometimes it'll connect right away, like beautifully. You're like, oh. Yeah. And some days the same drone, same controller won't connect. And you're like, oh. And, and if you go through these forums, they have people have different fixes for that. Like Wi-Fi okay. extenders is something they always recommend. Okay. Things like that. And I, I guess there's an app on your cell phone. You can download a, a Wi-Fi analyzer type thing so you can You'd have to read all about it, but you can actually see what the Wi-Fi is doing where you're at, and if okay. it's interfering or not. Yeah, I run a I run a separate um, like Wi-Fi router in my room in order to so I, you know to try and do Python stuff where you're controlling more than one at a time doing swarm right. stuff. Yeah. So I mean, but you you can get a Wi-Fi router that'll handle that stuff for like honestly like eighteen dollars. <laughs> it doesn't require a lot. So. Yeah. Oh, I haven't done this form stuff. That sounds exciting. I want to do that. <laughs> there's, there's usually lots of crashing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but that's pretty cool. Yeah. No, but I, I truly am amazed at all what can be done with that little thing. <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's pretty good for what for what the cost. It's crazy. Yeah. In fact, I, th I saw one example where a guy figured out how to fly that little tello outside in like 40, 40 mile an hour winds. <laughs> It tracks pretty well. I mean, I'm not gonna lie. I've, I've flown mine with that different app you can get the the Tello FPV one that's not made by DJI or whatever. Um, it'll let you fly it a lot harder, higher than the normal app does. Hmm. Like that. Cool. Yeah, we try to always stick with the basic free stuff as much as we can. Yeah. And then, have you guys gotten into the ag stuff at all? I know it's totally off topic. <laughs> no, Are you no, into, not like, at all. Ag drone stuff. Yeah, we do the ag stuff. I mean, we're in Northwest Minnesota, nothing but farm country. So yeah, we, okay, we fly farm fields. I've, I've been flying the P4 multispectral drone and we actually got an agorist and it's just been sitting in my office because I've been trying to figure out how to get this thing to work. And the Terra software finally worked to make a map. So I don't know if you guys are using that or. Uh, we do, we don't have that particular drone, but we, we do, uh, one thing we're working on right now is our, our river drainage system in our county. Okay. We have a series of main ditches that feed into the river 
And we take a LIDAR camera on one of our big industrial drones and we fly all of the ditches at least once a year to uh -huh. overlay on the years past and see what changes are happening in the ditches. That's cool. Yeah. yeah, we couldn't afford the LiDAR camera, but we got the P4 multispectral drone. It's pretty okay. No, oh, that's uh, a great drone to have. Yeah. Yeah, great. I mean, the multispectral is what you want, especially if you're a school, mm -hmm. get the most use out of it. Definitely uh, Steve's area more than mine, as far as the camera okay. stuff. <laughs> Steve yeah, Wilson. I'm learning too. <laughs> but yeah, are you coming to the uh, one on Thursday? Yeah, um, I have one overlapping meeting in between there but yeah i'll be there yeah I'm steve excited. and uh our one of our other uh guest instructors from st cloud university will be talking all about that kind of stuff okay cool because yeah, that's what i've been told i'm missing from like our drone tech they're like you need geospatial stuff i'm like okay yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, i really need to integrate that. Drone if you don't know what to do with it <laughs> what right. time is that one at on thursday it's oh. running from uh 10 until four it's a four hour with an hour break for lunch and That's central uh, until time, two, right? you mean? yeah central yeah. Time. um so the it'll be like in hour blocks first hour i'll be talking about imagery second hour we'll be talking about um gis third hour we'll be talking about geospatial yeah right after lunch we're gonna hit you with the heavy stuff <laughs> And then the last hour is going to be Kirk Stevie. He's a professor at St. Cloud uh, State University or University of Minnesota, St. Cloud, whatever they're calling themselves these days. But he's going to talk about um, GIS and agriculture. So he's, he's a farmer, he's a teacher, he's, he does the whole thing. He actually utilizes this stuff. And he's going to be talking Yay. about NDVI and um and that in usage in agriculture so I, if you if you can't make any of it and you're interested in the imagery stuff make sure to get there at three o'clock to hear kirk talk because then you'll get I'm a, a, good, I'm try to make it. I'm to make it. a good dose of the ag stuff and okay. the other three hours i'm just going to torture your brain with imagery and geospatial stuff so oh that's great I'll, just, i'm looking for just ask nerms i'll torture your brain <laughs> Exactly. Right on. Thank you for all the advice and tips. Really appreciate it. You're welcome. Yeah, and that, that's what we do. We're always here. So if you shoot us an email, things come up or whatever, we, we will get back to you and try to help you out as best we can. Yeah. And I'm always into collaboration too. So I'm always willing to share. <laughs> and where were you out of? Again, I'm sorry. Uh, Merced College, so Central Valley, California, as a community oh. college. Actually. Oh, way out there. Okay. Yeah. But we're right down the street from UC Merced. So we've been doing stuff with them and then, okay. um, you know, trying to make pathways, drone pathways. So I yeah. actually made some drone media classes so they could be offered in the high school. And then we have our drone tech, and then the UC is doing a ton of drone stuff. Right. So. I'm not sure make, where you're in relation to actually Palomar computer science. I'm actually computer science with so computer science pathways, but you know, robotics is where it's at with computer science. So, oh, you got the perfect drone, uh, tell them. right? <laughs> so, that's what I'm doing. Oh, great. I don't know where you're at in relation to Palomar College, um, up north from them. And okay. I have been to like conferences with them, and they've been super helpful. Yeah, I, I really appreciate it. I appreciate their curriculum online, I've used some of that. Yeah. This semester that was great some good projects yeah i know they have a, a lot of actual jobs out there i think for drone pilots or a need for them or they did a while ago well for us it's not a specific job title but they're integrating them into jobs that are already established and i'm i tell my students there'll be a drone job just job soon but like where we are, it'll be like, there's a lot of ag companies that'll designate someone as like the drone person right. <laughs> that's already working there. Yeah. And so. Yeah, law enforcement, different places. Yeah, like and then the law enforcement, it's just, you know, someone on the, he's already a police officer. Okay, actually the law enforcement out here doesn't even have his drone license, but whatever. Right. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, just picking someone on the team to like do the drones. But I figure as these things get bigger and I know they're working toward making, um, 
like the drone job descriptions in that database, which I think is going to be really important. Mm -hmm. You know, like actually having like separate drone job descriptions. Yeah. yeah. Especially for funding. Yeah, still just kind of a wild, wild west arena as far yes. as where you, what can be done and where you can go. But they are offering some internships, like these internships that are based around drone agriculture. So I've been selling it to my students that way. Take our class and you can get this like internship and they've been, you know, getting them and that's been good. Oh, yeah, that's great. Oh, it's all good stuff. Yeah, definitely. Anytime. I know. Do you guys have like drone jobs out there, like specific drone jobs? Yeah. We do have a couple companies right about an hour west of us here in Grand Forks, North Dakota, because we, we actually have okay. a whole, we were actually one of the FAA test sites. Oh, okay. That were selected. And we do have a couple like smaller drone companies that do a lot of the same type of things we do. Like they'll go fly a farm field or they'll go fly ditches or they have all the different types of camera setups. Oh yeah. Um, okay. We do have a company that just came in that's uh, kind of like a heavier lift drone type thing. I don't know too much about them. But these are like larger drones that can supposedly lift up to like three or 400 pounds. So I don't know how good a business they're doing, but we're, we're, we're a fairly remote area out here in Northwest Minnesota. So it's mostly all about ag, agriculture. Yes, actually Merced is kind of like that too. Like we're close enough to Silicon Valley, but it's pretty aggy out here, which is great. I love it, but yeah. yeah. We've also got a company here in Minnesota. It's called Centera. And oh yeah, we didn't have but, some Terra. Okay, yeah. 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 So well, I guess that would be a specific drone job, duh. Okay. Yeah. You get a hold of them and they, they yeah, should be able to Yeah, we do talk about Centera in class. Mm -hmm. Right on. And we're actually hoping to get out. That's one of the reasons we're working with uh Louisiana is to kind of they want to get obviously involved with the oil rigs and stuff like that with their drones. That's that's another aspect. We actually have the oil fields in North Dakota here. We haven't really gotten with them too much because they're they're quite a ways away from us, about four to six hours. Really? All right. I think I'm gonna take off, but I'll see you guys Thursday. And thank you so much. You know, I appreciate these webinars and things and oh, learning. Cool. Oh yeah, that's what I love about the the whole drone world. It's all about collaboration and yeah, seeing who's doing. I do what really like that part of it. Yes. All right. Well, okay. I guess we can call it a day there. If nobody else <laughs> has anything. All right. Well, thank you everybody for attending, especially those that hung out. And great, great talks. A lot of good input from you guys also. So. Appreciate right, thanks. That. Take care. Hope oh, you too. Everybody have a good one.